Okay, so how many of you know what Qigong is? Wow, okay, this is going to be easier than I thought. Um, do you know what a doctor of medical Qigong does? No, not really. Okay, all right. Well, you know, I planned on just talking a little bit about Qi. Um, how many of you know what it is? Okay, <laughs> Sven, I figured you would, yeah. It's, it's one of those very, it, people throw it around a lot, but I don't think people really understand what it is. So I hear these words, life force, it's life force energy, it is this and that, and it is the thing that we work on in acupuncture, but it's so much more than that. Chi is how you connect to everything. It's how you connect to your own body. It's how you connect to your own emotions. It's how you connect to your divine or your God or Tao or Buddha or whatever. It makes no difference what you call it, right? It's a word. Chi is that word that connects everything. So if I was to tell you that there was a system that's all maybe 10,000 years old, and it has survived persecution, book burnings, shootings, executions, and it's still around, what would you think of that system? Would you think that it had some value? Would you think that perhaps there's something that we could all learn from it? And that was my experience with Qigong when I started when I was five. So I think all of us want to have better communication. I think all of us, not just our personal communications, but what about our interpersonal communications? What's going on inside of your body right now? What's going on with your emotions? What's going on with your pathology? What's going on with the lack of pathology? How is and how is everything balancing itself? That's chi. And when you learn to work with Qi, you learn to work with all of those communications. Not only the communications within my own body, because you see Qi flows in the blood. In your blood. And we all know that blood has to touch every single centimeter, millimeter of your body. Otherwise, it goes through necrosis and dies. So Qi has to touch every single thing on your body. Otherwise, it dies. So qi is kind of important. The other aspect of Chinese medicine that you may have never heard of is there's this concept called shen. Have you ever heard of this word? Who's heard of shen? Okay, few. What is shen? Well, that's roughly translated as spirit or divine or God. Guess where shen resides? Take a wild guess. It's in your blood. So your spirit, the divine, all of your emotions also reside in the blood. Now you start to get an idea of why blood is so important in Chinese medicine, why we feel pulses, and we look at the vascularity of the tongue, and why we start to look at your color and we start to talk about circulation, the circulation of qi, not from a cardiorespiratory perspective or a cardiovascular perspective, but the circulation that's actually taking place within your body. Now, this is where it gets really weird. If you thought this was weird now, this gets really weird. So, qi also circulates outside of your body based on what's going on inside of your body. We call that wei qi. And there's three levels of Wei Qi. There's the physical, there's the emotional, and then there's the spiritual. And each of those has a realm that they touch in. The first is probably defined within the realms of, did you ever drag your feet across the floor and then go to reach for a doorknob and get shocked and you got electrostatic electricity came off in the knob and shocked you? Right? That static electricity is about the first realm 
of what we call the first level of chi. The second level of chi is all of you, how many of you are like, well, I'm just, just curious. All of you that are in therapy and you sit across from your clients, and all of you who are doctors or nurses and you sit across from clients, and you develop rapport, you're in the second way chi field, which goes anywhere from two to six feet out. And enveloping that Wei Chi field is what? Your heart and the emotions in your blood. And so when you start to really connect with someone and you start to feel them, what you're really feeling is the energy that is circulating through you that then starts to circulate out into your Wei Chi that connects with their Wei Chi. Because if yours goes out two to six feet, then theirs goes out two to six feet, and now they're co-mingling. Does, ever, does that sound strange to you all? And so when a therapist becomes very good, they can almost read the thoughts of their client. They almost can anticipate what's going to be said next. What they're doing, there's communication that's going on on something that we don't know what that something is. Is that bioelectrical? Is it electromagnetic? Is it a magnetic field? I don't think we have the words to really describe it accurately yet, but I think if we use the word chi, it'll cover it. So think of the implications of this. Now, how close are you all sitting together? Pretty close. So all of your Wei Chi's are commingling. Isn't that kind of wild? So the more close you feel, the more you're starting to vibrate on the level of the person that you feel comfortable with. That's communication. That's the communication of the chi. And when you make a statement and someone gets it, and they understand it on a level that's not just from knowledge base, but they feel it almost empathetically in their blood, you have communicated on a chi level. Now this is where it gets really interesting. There's a third level to Wei Chi. And that way, Chi extends out from the emotional to infinity. I didn't make this up, folks. This is not something new age. This is over 10,000 years old. And it's been the subject of study in Chinese medicine since people start putting these ideas together, whenever that was. For me, that goes back to the Zhao dynasty. And the specialty that I learned was called the Zhao Yu which is an oral tradition of which I'm an 89th generation Taoist priest and physician. And so these things have been talked about and worked with. And so when I train people or teach people, I teach people how to sense the Wei Qi, their own Wei Qi and others. And that to me becomes the communication that is far superior to neurological signaling to biophotonic signaling and all these other kind of methodologies that we're currently coming up with. This is instantaneous transformation of information. That transmission sometimes is why, and this is where it gets a kind of like woo-woo, okay, are you all ready for that? And that is why sometimes, did you ever sit with someone and you became really drained? That they just really just suck the life force right out of it, the coin of phrase. What they're doing is because of their chi deficiency. Their chi deficiency in their blood recognizes something in yours that would balance them, and they begin to draw because it's just nature, right? Energy's going to flow that way. So if I'm strong and you're weak, you're going to pull off of me or vice versa. And now, think of this implications for anybody who works in healthcare. After you set with what? People that are ill, who are suffering mentally, physically, or in pain, maybe even spiritually because they're blaming God for their pathology. Now they're draining a certain portion of your chi. And it's no wonder that you go home at night, because I teach a lot of therapists, a lot of therapists. 
Um, you go home at night, and you have to wind down. You have to take the edge off. You have to do, and I hope you have a practice. I hope you have something that's going to balance out your chi. Because that's what you're really trying, your body's trying to communicate that to you, to your mind. It just doesn't have the language. And so, how are you balancing yourself? How are you taking care of yourself that way? Do you have a practice that brings your chi back into order? And now you understand why qigong becomes just as important in the 21st century as it was 10,000 years ago. Do you think that we're that different from people 10,000 years ago? You don't think they loved and lost and hated and were jealous and worried and they had fear and trepidation? They had the same emotions. They may have different ways of coping with it, but they had the same emotions and the same effects on the body. And they figured out a system it's now called medical qigong, you can call it anything you want, to balance that out. So that's why it's been around a long time, because see, we haven't changed that much. We have not changed that much. So I'm going to pose the question to you, what are you doing for yourself to balance your energies? What are you doing for yourself to balance your energies? So a lot of people do forms of meditation and mindfulness and those kind of different things. So I'm going to share with you some very simple things. And I want you to keep in mind, so this, this thing that I'm talking about is qi communication has actually been studied um, quite a bit in Japan. Not so much in this country. There's a lot of studies. For instance, um, people that do qigong have measured, uh, been measured that out of their palms, a point called Lagon, pericardium 6, that in fact they can emit energy anywhere from 6 to 40 hertz out of their palms, and somebody who in fact is trained in Qigong can squelch that, turn that up and turn that down. And so when I'm working with peri uh, pediatrics and geriatrics, I gotta turn down the energy because I can emit Qi. And I know that sounds a little far-fetched, but we all emit Qi. It's just learning how to control it and learning how to work with this energy that is ethereal and intangible, but it is actually the greatest way to communicate with another human being. So, there is proof of this. Oxford University came out that said, <laughs> energetic signaling, that's what they called it, that's their phrase for chi is 100 times more effective than neurological signaling. So there's another system that's going on in your body besides your neurons and your synapses. But we just haven't been able to develop the tools to measure it yet. We're getting close. And then perhaps there'll be validation for this. And, you know, here's the thing. And I, I get this posed to me a lot because there's going to be someone that says, well, you know what? They've done studies where they've shown sham acupuncture. Have you heard these things? Sham acupuncture. And you know what? We put it in a point and it caused an effect. Well, you have to consider that anything that anybody does to you therapeutically has a 30% chance with placebo. I'll take that 30% chance if that improves my symptomology 30%. In, in the course of Chinese medicine and acupuncture, there's no such thing as sham. If I manipulate your qi, any place that I stick a needle in and I touch your blood, and especially if I have intention behind that, and I can emit qi into that point, to the point where I can actually twirl that needle around without touching it, something's going into that meridian system. And that is information. Now my intention is to balance that meridian system. Do you all know what I mean when I say meridian system? I digress. Okay. These are the pathways of chi. Another way, the way we were thinking of it, though, is these are the choices in life that you made. The choices in life you make actually construct and build the, the meridian system in your body. And that's why they're living, breathing, and moving. They are not static. 
You cannot go on an acupuncture chart and trace that on your body and say, there it is, because it vacillates and moves as you do. It's alive, it works with your breathing and your breath, and it's very much a part of you, your emotions and your thinking and your intention. That's the Meridian system. That's not what's taught in TCM. TCM was a package deal to sell to physicians. Classical Chinese medicine believes that it is an alive and breathing system of meridians that transport the qi in these rivers and streams in the body. And that it constantly moves, and this is where it gets really strange, but it will be interesting to all of you who do therapy in one form or another, that emotional trauma consumes qi to hold it in pockets we call Lao meridians. There is a whole systemology of what's called Lao meridians that are created based on your unique pathology, based on the unique interpretation of your mind and how you construct the thoughts around an event, post-event. Does that make sense to you? So everybody has these MPEGs that plays. So you can have an event, but how you interpret that and your self-talk and how you remember it and how you build things around it also are attached to that and the chi has to manage that. Nothing's free in the universe. Everything costs something. That chi has to manage that. So the more of this you have locked away in these Lao meridians, the more stuff that you have, more baggage, if you will, the more baggage you have, the more qi is consumed to manage the baggage. So qigong is a way to remove the emotional baggage that's trapped in the energetic matrix within the body so that you, in fact, can have a quality of life. If you have to micromanage everything, that takes away a lot of your energy. And very specifically, I found in working with cancer, fibromyalgia, and MS patients, that a lot of times they have huge pockets along the spine, what we call the Vatu Jaji points. And those points along the spinous process usually are very locked down and they usually come into the liver. And in fact, we have a point called Spleen 21 on the side that actually has a huge repository. It's kind of like your body locks this stuff down in specific areas. This is all foundational basic Chinese medicine that is right across from your heart. So anything that injures your heart, that has hurt you, rejection, abandonment, betrayal, it doesn't, the body doesn't want to take away the heart's energy. That would be detrimental. It moves it to the side. And that's what inhibits the breathing. So when you ask patients of fibromyalgia, anybody in pain, cancer, MS, Lou Gehrig's disease, all these kinds of patients that I deal with, to actually inhale deeply, they can't. Because the serratus and the intercostals and all these muscles that are along the side, they're so locked down that all they can do is breathe thoracically. And then when you try to teach them how to do belly breathing, they can't get it. Because physiologically what has happened is the chi consumption in that area is so great, there is nothing there to allow anything to descend. It's amazing. But every single patient I've ever seen that had chronic pain, fibromyalgia, cancer, or was very weak from chemotherapy or radiation, cannot breathe deeply. And that's one of the foundations of health as we've discussed here today. So that's in, that's, that should be an intrinsic factor. But it's now not. You have altered your basic God-given right to breathe. And breathe in the way that nature intended. I always joke that's, you know, original manufacturer settings because that's how you breathe when you're a baby. But then along the way, you accrue so much baggage that you kind of forget. And then it's no longer available to you. So something as simple as breathing. And I'm going to give you a different perspective on breathing. This is more of a Taoist way of thinking. So what signifies the beginning of life for us? The first inhale. Right? What signifies the last 
thing that you will ever do before you transition the exit, which is a part of the process. What's in between? What's that? That's the box. Right? Well, in Taoism, we say that's where you meet God. That's where you meet the Tao. That's where you meet the Creator. Because here's what's an interesting experiment. Get people to breathe and have them focus on the pause. And most people start looking at Try it. Just take a real deep inhale and then try to stay in the center of your pause equal to the length of time that it took you to inhale and then equal to the length of time that it took you to exhale and see the physiological reactions in your body. Go ahead, just try it. Cue me. Just try it. See if it can be equal. What's happening? Is it equal? Is it shorter? Shorter? Is that pretty true? So one of the things that we do, we call it Taoist breathing, um, is we try to get people to learn how to breathe. So they're only breathing four to six breaths per minute. That's pretty slow. And imagine what's happening to your heart rate blood pressure, all those kind of different things. But the problem I found is not the inhale and not the exhale. It's the pause in between. Because here's what happens. People panic. People panic. I gotta get that air. I gotta get that air. Like, it's not gonna be available. But in your mind, there's a fear statement. And it's where fear enters in. We call fear the mother of all emotions. And it's that basic intrinsic fear of dying. So now you start to look at work by like Joseph Campbell and so forth about the hero or the warrior, that person that is willing to lose his life for a cause. You all familiar with Joseph Campbell? Right? Right? So he, he talks about going into the dark of the forest, right? That's facing your fears. That's going into your fears. What happens when you become fearful? All of you, what happens? <gasps> right? You lock it down. Nothing's happening. Nothing's moving in, nothing's moving out. You're not going the normal cycle. It's not that you're pausing. You're holding. And that means a lack of movement. And anytime there's a lack of movement, there's stasis in Chinese medicine. Stasis breeds disease. That's the foundation of Chinese medicine. And then it can lead to phlegm and nodules and tumors and all kinds of different things. But the basic foundation of it is if that is not, if the qi is not moving in the meridians along with the blood, qi is yang, blood is yin. The yin-yang balance with the shen in between moves and transitions into your blood, into your body. But when you stop it and you hold it, out of fear, it gets locked down. So emotions to us are easily treatable just as physiological symptomology is. Because it's all in the blood, it's all traveling in pathways that we know. Chinese medicine never separated this, nor did they separate spirituality. It never happened. The reason why it happened is when they put together TCM, they had a package it that appeared in a very very scientific way. And that meant remove all that spirituality stuff and remove all that psychological babble and well, now we're gonna get down to something. We're gonna do something esoteric by putting needles into someone and releasing their pain. And then like when President Nixon got to see, we're gonna do an operation. We're gonna remove someone's appendix and we're not gonna give them any anesthesia. All we're gonna do is we're gonna insert a couple needles and then we're gonna open them up Take out their appendix, and that patient is going to talk the whole time. That's the power of acupuncture. And when Nixon's seen this, he's going, we don't have this. So him and Mao Zedong got together, and the next thing you know, 
He's going to Harvard, Yale, and all these other major universities saying to all their medical programs, to all their docs, you better go find out what's going on about this. Because they're doing something over there that I can't explain, and neither can you find out what it is. So conveniently, they package a nice little system called traditional Chinese medicine into matching what the physicians in the United States were ready to hear. Now, this is in the 60s. So that's where you get TCM. That is not classical Chinese medicine. Classical Chinese medicine has all the attributes of the emotional and the spiritual still part of the protocol of the treatment. So when you learn these deeper meridian systems, you're starting to get into the very places that trauma and baggage are existing. And then we teach people how to release them. So that, in fact, they can go to someone like Dr. Chaudhry and they can talk about it. But until the energetic pocket is actually stimulated and released, as soon as the mind re-engages it, it reactivates it. And that's why you've got to clean that up. You've got to get to the root of the problem. It's like a weed. If you cut the top off of a weed, it looks good for a while, but then it grows back. And that's exactly what happens with pathology. You gotta get the root. You gotta go after the root and know where the root is and where it resides, and you have to go after it in the same communicative process that it got put there, which is chi. Now that sounds maybe woo-woo, but you know what? This has been around for a long time, and nothing survives unless it works. And this works. So I work with a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists because I want them to become aware of what? The energetic matrix system that we're all saturated in all the time. And if you want to think about it in a very warm and fuzzy way, this is actually how we're all connected. You've heard that, right? We're all connected, we're all one. So the chi of the earth is something that I feel. That's my practice. As a Taoist, we rely on nature to teach me. To teach me. To show me its cycles and its rhythms and its patterns. And from that, I understand cycles and rhythms and patterns, and I can see the cycles and rhythms and patterns in my patients. So, to me, it's very simple. Now, here, here's the thing. Um, at least in, in, in the sect that I'm from, Formless Taoism, we don't care so much if people believe it or not believe it. Because that's about outcome. And we're not concerned with outcomes. We're busy being present. As soon as you project your mind into repeatable outcomes, you've lost the moment. So we don't worry about outcomes, and we don't worry about actually having someone convinced of our argument. And you would be amazed when you release outcomes how freeing and liberating your life can be. Think about that word outcomes, because everything you've been training in traditional schools is about outcomes. Your grades on your test, whether or not you pass the bar, whether or not you get the promotion, whether or not you get the grades, whatever it is, it's all about outcome based. And when you release outcome and you're ready to freely embrace life in this moment and not care about outcomes, do you realize how much chi you have available to really enjoy this moment? Because you're not consumed in the past, which we say is in your liver, or in the future, which is in your spleen and all the work. So now, those two organs are liberated. We no longer have to contend with them. To me, this is an amazing system. It's just getting the language right so that we can express it in a 21st century fashion, so that people get it. How much time do I have left? 10? Okay, cool. I want to show you Chima. All right? So, um, we'll do this. I'm going to show you Chima. I have to take off my jacket, so bear with me. So, here's what I want you to do. I want you all to stand up. 
And this is the simplest Qigong that I could ever show you. It's a Qigong for the lungs. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay? All right. I'm used to throwing my books since so lunch. Okay? The idea is I want you to be very aware of the breathing that takes place in your back, not in your front, but I want your back to actually move because you're a three-dimensional creature. Why would you breathe in a two-dimensional fashion? Breathe into your back. Make your back move like this. I want you all to see this. Can you see that? Is it moving? That's freedom. That's freedom. That's the root of all Chinese qigong, is to be able to breathe that way. And that stimulates your enteric nervous system, which is a system that rivals your central nervous system insofar as neurological cell count. And it's also the foundation and basis of all SSRI medications, which we've had to use the gut to transfer past the blood-brain barrier. They're called zonulin and zot. University of Maryland did this research 20 years ago. But the idea is this gut, this lower dantian as we call it, needs to be stimulated through the breath all the time. And if you're not doing that, you're not stimulating your enteric nervous system, which is all of your digestion, and it is all of your ability to assimilate nutrition, water and food and air. So if you're not activating this, how can you be healthy? Do you do that again? Which? The back breathing? Okay, this way? I don't know if you'll see it all, but... You see it? Okay? So just do that. It takes practice, I'm kidding. But first of all, you have to loosen up all those muscles back there, because you're always so rigid and tight, right? We're taught this posture and you know, walking around all buff and everything. Uh, it, but the idea is you got to relax and you got to kind of round your body. So open up your joints, open up your knees, allow your shoulders to slump, right? And now, breathe. Breathe without muscle tension. Breathe into your back. Awaken your kidneys, your essence, your mission statement in life. Because that's in Chinese medicine where you hold your mission statement. It's in your kidneys. It's a little extra. Okay? Your kidneys hold your destiny in Chinese medicine. So to awaken your destiny, you got to breathe into your kidneys. And here's how you're going to do that. You're going to make the lowest organ, the yin organ of the kidneys, communicate with the highest organ, the lungs. And we're going to create that communication by doing a qigong that's very simple. And all you're going to do is you're going to do this like you're going to tread water. You're going to inhale. Rotate. And exhale. Like a bellow. Right? Your shoulders should be down. They should be relaxed. Feel like you're sinking. Inhale again, just like you're treading water. Relax the wrists, the elbows, the shoulders, no muscle tension. Release at the SCMs in your neck, all those muscles that cause us migraine headaches. Release, let it go. Inhale, take in the chi of the earth. Take in the chi that is in this room. And then exhale. Now, here's the visualization. I'm going to pull chi in through Lao Wung point, which is this point on your hand, kind of like when you drop your finger down, your hair's parting. Okay? Right in there is the activation point, where it moves in and out like a two-lane highway. And I'm going to breathe into this point. I know that sounds a little strange, but you go, oh, I breathe with my nose. I don't know about you. No, you actually breathe with your palms and your feet and the top of your head, by feet. This point and this point, bilateral, you're going to breathe and suck it in like a vacuum cleaner. Suck it in, your arms are the hoses, and then it's going to actually come in and spirally wrap your lungs. There is a visualization for you. Saturate the lungs like water in a sponge, and then descend down into your lower dantian. You got the visualization? 
vacuum cleaner, suck it in, saturate, descend into the lower dantian, and nourish your cortex. So here we go. Traditionally, we do this 24 times. Each movement, relax more and more. Sink. Heal the chi. Focus your mind on what you're doing. Focus on relaxing. Focus on feeling it go inside. Make the connection from the outside to the inside in your mind. This is chica. There's a lot more to it, but that's your primer, so to speak. <laughs> When I went out, okay, in Chinese medicine, the lungs are paired with the large intestine. We were talking about poop earlier, right? Okay, so you're going to go down there, and you're basically going to send qi so that organ system works efficiently. Okay, so you're actually going to bring it the whole way down to the perineum, to the pelvic floor, and then let it saturate and build and fill like a bathtub getting filled with water. Okay. Does that make sense? That's Qigong. That's how simple it is. So if you're convalescent, you can do it. Anybody can do this. Am I out of time? Good. 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 Good.